This morning, I'd like to take some time here to share with you something that I think is very important, especially as we uh, celebrate today and remember uh, what Jesus has done for us. We live in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I said we live in the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing for us to do but honor him and glorify him in everything we do and say. That we are to operate in his goodness, his faithfulness, his completeness so that others can see Christ in us. Amen? We've been talking about, Eric was sharing with us, and, and it's important that we understand, and I'm going to title this this morning, The Author and the Finisher. I know the Bible says the author and the finisher of our faith, but I want to focus on the author and the finisher. When we understand who we are in Christ, we understand that it's him and only him that provided us with the way to salvation, that provides us with the strength and the endurance to live this life as he wants us to live. And I want to share this this morning. We had a great study on this on Wednesday, and uh, God had already given me the scriptures that I was going to share this morning. And uh, then Frank brought them into um, the subject on Wednesday night. For those of you that weren't there, you missed out on a great a time of study. But we're going to uh, share it with you right now. So open your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 17 through, 17 through 21. I'll give you just a moment to find it. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17, it says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, and believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Far above... All principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Amen. Amen. To the reading of the word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Get out of here. My, my, my thing is, uh, you sell it. Okay. I hate it when I get pop-ups and they stand right in the middle of my screen, you know. Today, I want to focus on the author and finisher of our faith, and that is naturally is Jesus Christ. In verse 8 there of chapter 1, Paul, the, this here that Paul is giving to us is, is part of a prayer. He, he gave us three different prayers, and this is one of them. It says, I, he says, I want to focus, or I'm telling you, I want to focus on verse 8 there. It says, where he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All wisdom. And again, we're getting this confirmation that everything that we have, everything that we need in order to live this Christian life, you already have. You already have it. Jesus has already provided it. God has given it to us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He placed his word in us. He placed his spirit in us. He gave us power and authority. Just as we read there in verse 21, that Jesus came overcame all the power and authority and dominion of this world. And he is now living in us. And all of that is operating in and through us. Amen. In Ephesians 8 there, it says that he, Paul is saying that God has already abounded toward us. Look at this at verse 8. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That word prudence there means he's already given us the skill and the good judgment to put his provisions to work. See? Again, we're always saying, we're always saying to, uh, to ourselves, well, I don't know if I understand that. I don't know if I can do that. Or here's the one we'd really like. I can't do that. 
well, how can we say we can't do that when God has already given us everything we need in order to do it? Amen. He's already supplied. The word spirit is used in a different way, in two different ways. It's used to identify the spirit of God, but it also identifies the spirit of man. Because our spirit man is now alive to the spirit, to the word of God, to the things of God. Therefore, we have that understanding already living in us. Amen. For those of us who are born again. The Christian life is not an attempt to get more faith. I hear that all the time. I need more faith. And we even read that when the disciples were saying, were saying to Jesus, give us more understanding, give us more faith. I'm sharing with you today that it's already been given to you. That there, this is not an attempt to get more faith, nor more anointing. I've shared this before. Or get closer to the Lord. We already have these things in the fullness. Christ is the fullness of God. And Christ is in us. He is the head. We are the body. He is the fullness of Almighty God. Amen? Romans 12, 3, it says there, God has already done this. It says God has, uh, he has dwelt, sorry, God has already done and what has he done? He has dwelt in every man the measure of faith, the measure of faith, and not a measure of faith. What we need, according to Paul, is a revelation. We need a revelation of what is already ours, not what we're expecting to happen someday when I know more about this Bible and I've, and I've um, um, uh, memorized more Scripture because all that word, everything that acknowledges Christ and who he is and what he has done is already in us. Amen? So what we need to do is have this revelation of what is already ours. But how do we know if we don't read the book? How do we know unless we spend time in a relationship with Christ, with the Spirit, and allowing him to teach and move us into his, his understanding? In verse 18 there of first. Um, uh, of our Ephesians 1, it says, the eyes of your understanding. Jesus, as we can't uh, see with our physical eyes when they're closed, neither can we see with understanding if our minds are closed. So we have to have an open mind to understand what the word says. If the word says it, we need to believe it. We need to trust it. It says that the word, the word we can trust. Amen? That God is faithful. In Luke 24, 45, I know I'm going a little fast, but I'm short on time this morning. And, and I, really, I really feel the urgency in my spirit to speak of this authority that we already have, that Jesus is our, our, the author of everything that we need in life. There's nothing we need in life except him. And he is the provider. He authorized it and he turned around and he wrote the book in John 1.1, 1, 1, as Eric mentioned, he is the living word. He is the living word. And so everything he spoke, everything he did, what did was according to the word so that he is the example that we live by. If we take that word and we operate in the word instead of our five senses of operating in the natural life will have an understanding. The understa eyes of our understanding will be enlightened to the Spirit of God, to the Word of God. That when God says that I'm the God that supplies all of your needs, He means all your needs. And He meets each and every one of them. He's not too big that He doesn't care about the small things. He cares about every everything that we deal with in life and he wants to be a part of it as i mentioned luke 24 verse 45 says then he opened their understanding this was jesus remember when he was talking to his disciples he said open their eyes of understanding that they might understand the scriptures see this is why we have the holy spirit as the gift from god dwelling in us so when we open up the word he opens up our eyes of understanding so that we have knowledge of the word and what the word has is already provided. Amen. 
It takes the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts. You know, we talk about him all the time. But how much, how much do we pay attention to him and allow him to open up our eyes so that we understand, to have communion with him, to talk with him, allow him to give, to, to release the power that we're holding on to and release his power to oper operate in each and every one of us. In verse 18 there of, of Ephesians 1, it says that you may know. I want you to notice this. It's very, very important as we were studying this on Wednesday night. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know, watch this, the hope of his calling. Huh? Not my calling, not your calling, but his calling. He has called each and every one of us to operate in his name, his authority on this earth today as we live this life. As his representatives, as his disciples. And he is operating or we operating in the hope of his calling. And continues on, the inheritance that is within us, listen to this, it's his inheritance. We didn't earn it, but he's the supplier. It's his inheritance that he received from God. And now he turns around and, re and, and uh, releases that, that inheritance to us. And everything that we have uh, is all through Christ. Apart from Christ, we have nothing. We are nothing, but in Christ, we can do all things. We have all things. It's already been supplied. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. It came through his holiness, not ours. And it re, uh, remains because of his faithfulness, not ours. Say amen. amen. I'm telling you, this is good news. See, what is, what, is it, what is it saying? What is the word saying here? It's not relying on how good I am. It's how good he is. It's not how powerful I am. It's how powerful he is. Amen. It came through his holiness, not ours. The riches of his glory, in, uh, the second part of this verse here, the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. Did you see that? His inheritance is in the saints. That means it's already there. So you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to go uh, um, uh, expecting or be praying God to give you more of the inheritance of what you need. He's already placed it in each and every one of us. Amen. We simply need to use more of what we already have. See, that's why when we pray this morning, we're praying for Les and Jenny and for others that are going through the battles of life. And we, we continue to hold them up in prayer, but we're not asking God for something he's already supplied. See, it got, it got silent. Well, I understand that at times it's, it's hard in our own understanding of how do you pray for healing when healing's already been given. Well, how do you pray for strength? You ask for more strength. You ask for more understanding. And this is what Eric was praying this morning as we listened to him being praying this morning over um, Les and Jenny and others that are fighting this fight right now. Because there's some in here right now that I've been praying for for weeks. But that doesn't mean I stop praying because I already know it's already there. See, I, I, I got I to gotta jump a little bit because I know in my spirit it's already there. How do I know that? The word says so. It says by his stripes we were healed. We took communion this morning. His flesh took on our sicknesses and diseases, according to Isaiah. And also in, in, in uh, 1 Peter there, it says there, there, by his stripes we were healed. Well, the were is a past tense. So if the Bible says it's past tense, how am I to pray? Past tense. Giving God glory for the healing that is mine. 
It's already been provided. The healing has already been provided. And we come in agreement of that healing taking place. And we ask for wisdom and knowledge. We ask for strength. We ask for the power of the Holy Ghost to come upon their body and touch them. But inside, in our spirit, man, who we are in Christ says it's already done. So we can't pray for something that's already ours. We thank him. That second song we sang this morning, did you notice how many times it repeats? I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank him, thank him, thank him, thank him, thank him. Because I cannot say that enough. Because he's done more than I'll ever be able to thank him for. Verse 19 there, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. <laughs> See, again, there, we, we understand what is already provided to us by the author and the finisher of our faith, and we operate in the knowledge of what he has already done, what he's already provided. None of us ever pray after we've already received Christ. None of us ever pray for salvation. Why? Because you already got it. So what, what, why do we pray for all these things that we keep asking God for? And God is saying, I've already provided everything you need. I've already provided in my son, Jesus Christ. Follow him. Do what he do, does or has done. Those are the things you and I as followers, as disciples of Christ are called to do. And these things you shall do and greater things. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 119. And let's start in verse 10 there. Uh, and in my Bible, at the top of the page, it says, a desire to know God's way. Huh? Huh? Do you have a desire to know God's way? Well, he's already put that way in you. He's already provided it. But listen to this words. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared. Again, we have to speak. See, what has been placed in us, we also have to speak out. The word says here, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the ways of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. See, all of this is nothing about me. I'm only doing and seeking the things of God, the word of God, the will of God, which is his word. It's his living word. And I will delight myself in your statutes. And watch this, watch this. I will not forget your word. Huh? I will not forget your word. I'm going to meditate. If you continue on, look at the, uh, or I will delight in, and I will not forget your word. I want to go, I know I've talked about this so many times, but I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel. Chapter 17. And once again, I want to share with you, going along with what we just read and what we're talking about here in understanding what God has already provided and this, and, and Eric mentioned it and we've celebrated this blood covenant that Christ gave to you and I that night in the upper room with his disciples. He said, this is the new covenant. So there was an old covenant that was in action, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, it became a blood covenant or a new covenant of, with man through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the blood covenant. But prior to that, there was an, a covenant in, in uh, operation. And we've talked about this when it came to David meeting Goliath. I want you to look at this um, starting in verse 24. Because I think this relates 
very much in what we sometimes do and how we, how we react to situations when we have things like we do right now that are coming at us, that are coming at the United States and they're trying to change what is, uh, what is rightfully ours according to uh, God's word, first of all, but also according to our Constitution. God's word supersedes our Constitution because the Constitution was written on the precepts and the understanding of the Holy Scriptures. God wrote them, and he used man once again. But watch this in verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. I think this is important, and that's why I added it in here, because of the fact that all of Israel, the army of King Saul, has been listening to this loud mouth for days. In fact, if you read, it's about 30 days that he's been, he's been doing all this taunting. Day and night taunting the men of Israel. And it says here that they were all afraid. Now go to verse 26. Then this young man named David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done with this man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? But I want you to really notice this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should de uh, defy the armies of God? See, David is saying to Goliath, he's using this in comparison to the covenant or understanding the covenant that he has with God. He knows his covenant. He's already seen the promises of God at work. Look at verse 37. Listen how sure-minded, this is important, how sure-minded David was. There's no room for doubt. Listen, the Lord delivered me. He didn't say the Lord will. He said the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. What are you going through? What are you dealing with? What's coming at you? What are you concerned about in your life today? Do you understand you have a blood covenant with Jesus Christ? And he's already paid the price. He's already provided everything you need to go through whatever it is we are going through. So we can rejoice. God's promises are not for just the moment. This isn't a promise just for David. This is a, an on opportunity for you and I to look that this has been going on throughout time. God is the provider. And he does not go back on his word. He will not forget what he's promised. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistine. Verse 45, look at that. David says to Goliath, notice here, there's some speaking that needs to take place. Huh? It's not praying. Don't go off onto your t off to the side. Well, I got to pray before I do this. See, David already knew the promises that were his. He already understood the covenant that he had with Almighty God. And he'd already witnessed God protecting him from the bear and the lion. And this is what he's shouting out. David says to Goliath, and David moved on Goliath with a mouth in motion. He spoke what was in his heart. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin? Listen to this. You bring your worldly stuff. Take your best shot. Come on, stand up on the word of God. We have a blood covenant with God. A greater covenant than what David had. And yet we look at this, this story being told to us, and this is something that we just need to ponder on, then understanding that this is a covenant David had. We have a greater covenant, and we should be standing with the same authority and the same understanding of who we are in Christ. 
Whew. Now watch this. This day, verse 46, this day. Do you remember last week we were in uh, Hebrews 11.1? 1? It says, now, faith is. But the first word is what? Now. The same thing David said, this day, today, right now. God is going to put you in my hands. You're going down. Ooh, come on. <laughs> this day, same as we read in there. Now, there's no difference. This day or saying now, David could have said right now, this is what's going to take place. But he said this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will. See, there's nothing negative. Well, I hope God shows up. I hope he's still listening. I hope he understands what little old me is going through. <sighs> and this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. That there is the power of God, the blood of Jesus Christ living in me and now coming through me to work against whatever it is that is trying to come against me. Whatever your Goliath is, God is more than enough. The finished work, the finisher, the author, and the finisher. The finisher is more than enough. All mean the same when it comes to the faithfulness of God. Hebrews 3, 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, what does the word say? The word says he is. Not that he will be someday or we will have it someday. I've heard that all my life raising up. Someday in the great by and by. And Christ is saying, I'm living in you. I'm, I'm the provider who's providing everything you need to overcome the things in life that come at you today. How can we live that Christian, that understanding life, the power of God living in us someday and not live it now? David spoke back to Goliath. He was always speaking. Notice he didn't walk out there all silent and just come as a surprise attack and take the stone out of his little pouch and go whipping his, his slingshot. He was constantly speaking. Are we constantly speaking? Are we speaking at whatever it is we're dealing with? Or are we just thinking it in our mind? Because see, if we try to figure it out in our understanding, see, this is what we were talking about back there in Ephesians 1, that God would open up the understanding. Our eyes need to be opened up to what has already been provided for us. What does the word say? How does the word fit in my situation? My God is greater than my situation. Look at verse 47. Now watch. Then all the assembly, I love this. If you've never seen it before, open your eyes to it now. Then all the assembly, assembly he's talking about Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians. David let everyone know all shall know the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. See, it's just not for Goliath to know. It's for all of Israel to know. Every, all the armies, we know that they were in a, in a valley. David and Goliath were down in the valley and the army of the uh, Philistines was on one side and the Israelites were on another and they're sitting there taunting. But you know what? The Philistines were louder than the Israelites. And the Israelites had a covenant with God. Today we have the same thing. The world is louder than we are. Verse 48, Dave hurried. David, he hurried. 
He didn't wait to see if God was going to show up. He didn't wait to say, oh, man, I wonder if this rock's going to hit its mark. I wonder if, I wonder if, I, wa- I wonder, I wonder, I just, boy, I'm hoping but it doesn't. Verse 48 says, David hurried and ran toward the, the army to meet the Philistine. He already knew the battle was won. The author and finisher of our faith. My faith is in Jesus Christ. And he's already supplied everything that I need to operate, to live this life that he's called us to. He's supplier of all my needs. We were reading that earlier. That he is the one that sustains us. You know, one that we all know. And I'm going to close here very quickly. 2 Timothy 1.7. We've been talking about this, this verse. I've heard it spoken more in the last year and a half than I have since I was born again back when I was 10 years old. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind. Sound mind. Most of us recognize that dread, fight, uh, a fright and terror are not uh, from God. In other words, all this fright and I'm a I'm a feared, I'm a scared, whatever it might be. All this, it's, we understand that it's not for God, but we often fail to put things like timidity. Are we timid? If we read, we just read about David here. Was there anything timid about David? See, he was constantly telling this giant what is. He kept telling him, this day, today, right now, you're done. Who is this uncircumcised? In other words, what he's saying, he doesn't have a covenant. The covenant was with Israel. They are circumcised. Shyness or timidity timidity is just being afraid of what others think of us. Oh, that hits home, doesn't it? I'm sorry, it does with me. I've been in situations where um, I'll be in the middle of a group and, and it's not at church, it's not in my Bible study, it's just in a group of men or something, and they start talking and I mention Christ and all of a sudden it gets real silent. And all of a sudden, so do I. Ever been there? Come on, be, faith, be, be honest. We all have. Well, this is what he's talking about, that others think of us. It's the root to pride and self-centeredness. See, it's all about me. Is it not? It's all about me. What do they think of me? The Amplified Bible translates this verse, listen. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving, or um, cringing, or fawning fear. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind. Well-balanced mind. And discipline and self-control. I love that. It really gets into understanding how we should operate, how we should live this Christian life. That it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of what I'm living today. What each one of us, the life that we are living, he is the author. He wrote the book. And not only did he write down all the details and everything, he turned around and he finished it. He performed it. Hebrews uh, 12, you can turn there if you want to. Verse 1 says, let us run with endurance. It's important to realize that there are other things that are not blatant sin that will hinder us in our race. Have you ever witnessed a a race, especially um, my granddaughters were doing cross country. Have you ever watched a runner in in a long race? How many of them show up with... Um, headgear on. Um, you got to have a covering over us in case it, the weather changes. Uh, something to protect our skin, something to protect this, and boots on, 
because, you know, those little shoes don't give us a whole lot of protection. So we got to have big army boots and all this stuff. See, we never see that. That's not the impression or the imagine we, the picture we get when we think of a long distance runner. We see them almost naked. Don't we? A little bitty shirt, a little bitty, and his shorts are so short. And some of them have socks, most of them don't. And they have this little flat shoe with these pointy spikes on it. That's what I remember. I don't know if they use spikes today or not, but back in my day they did. It's important to realize that, 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 that just a runner has to remove the weights. If a runner has to re re remove the weights in order to get his best results, don't we have to get rid of our weights? What is hindering us from running our race? Our race to be a good finisher. See, we need to keep our minds focused on Christ. He is the finisher. He's the author and he's the finisher. See, that means he authorized it and then he performed it to perfection. And he's saying, follow me. In all the decisions we make, the, the things that we do in life, in our everyday walk of life, are we focused on Jesus or are we focused on me? See, we live in a world that talks about me, myself, and I. And that's all they talk about. What's good for me, what's right for myself, it's all about me. I deserve it. There's nothing in there. In verse 2, it said, a runner has to have a goal. Do we have a goal? As we run this race, do we have a goal? Is it, well, someday in the great by and by, or is it right now? See, I, I believe that we're all winners right now. Because we follow the winner. He's already finished the race. And if he is in us, the finished work is operating already in us. The endurance, the strength, the wisdom, the understanding, all is open and um, being focused on the author and finisher who is Jesus Christ. And he supplies the faith and the endurance and the power and the strength that we need in order to run the race. And if we have anything that's honest, see, this is why we need to be focused on him. Because if we see how he operates, then I realize that I'm operating a little bit different and I need to remove something because it's hindering my operating or my time of finish. It's slowing me down. I'm not going to get the good time results. He wasn't occupied with suffering, but the spoils of victory. That's my Jesus. We celebrated that today as we remember his suffering on the cross. But he wasn't focused on the cross. We remember, and I know many will say, well, what about in John 17 when Jesus was in Gethsemane and he was praying? Father, if you can take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. See, there again, it's focused on God's will. He wasn't focused on his will. He was focused on God's will. And what was God's will? It all began back in Genesis 1 or Genesis 2 and 3. He already had a plan of salvation. And this plan could not be finished until the finisher finished it. And whatever was required of him, he set aside himself to honor God so that he could stay, be spread out on that cross. As Sharon said this morning, it was a table. We look at the cross and we see this. But it was a table that you and I can come to and feed on. He is the bread of life. And the blood that was shed was for our remission of sin. Amen. That's why he's able to endure such a uh, contradiction of sinners against himself. That's the same for us. To endure hardship, we have to follow this example of Jesus and fix our eyes on the good, not the bad. See, when we see the giant down there, we need to be like David. Who is this uncircumcised, big mouth Philistine? What right does he have 
to defy the people of Israel, the God of Israel. Because see, all he was saying, everything, all the words he was saying, he was saying to taunt the men, to make them afraid. But when David heard it, he heard that he was speaking against his God. He was speaking against God of, the God of Israel. And that's what upset David. That's what encouraged David to go after him. But David already knew God is faithful. He already let me beat the bear and the, and the lion. You're just another obstacle in my course of life. Jesus is the author and he's the finisher. And I think today we can really look at that and see that we've received a little bit different understanding of that passage, the author and finisher. He started it and he finished it. And everything in between has been perfected by him so that you and I can not only begin the race, we can endure the race and we can become out, come out the other end as victors because he overcame the grave and we have too. And you're going, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I ain't died. Well, I hope you have. Because the Bible says that we need to die to ourselves and be risen up in the, in, the, um, in the ways of Christ. So we need to die his death and be resurrected into new life in him. That's why it says that I'm a new creation, a new creature. It's a new man who lives. The old one's what? Dead. So my old ways of operating, my old ways of thinking, my old ways of believing are dead. There's a new creation, a new man rising up. Another David. More than that, another Jesus. Because when we speak, people should hear and see Jesus in us. Amen. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. There again, always the word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just give you glory and praise. I thank you. I so thank you for the word. Not only the written word, but I thank you that Jesus is the living word. And you've given us an example, a perfect example of how we're to live this life. Not in what we don't have, but what you have already provided. Because everything we have has been provided through your son, Jesus Christ, that we can walk victorious. We already know, according to your word, that we are victorious. We win. Why is it that we, we, we falter when something tries to tempt us? Which we should be like David. Who is this? I'm a child of the living God. I'm born again. I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. The power of the living God is dwelling in me. His spirit resides. This is the temple of the living God. And when you're coming at me, you're coming at God, the temple of God. And I thank you, God, for the strength in the and the understanding, as we read there in Ephesians, Paul saw that our, our, the eyes of our understanding, understanding what? Of who we are in Christ, what he's already provided. We're not weak, broken, sick, and disgusted. We are victorious in Christ. Everything we need, you've already provided. We just need to be like we sang in that song, give thanks with a grateful heart. Because Jesus has already paid the price that we can live this life and live it to its fullest. And most of all, so that we can share the goodness of our God and the faithfulness of our Christ as we live this life and people will be drawn to Christ in me. And Father, we give you all the glory and the praise this morning. We thank you for that precious sacrifice that you made as today we remember. But we remember each and every day as we remember what Christ has done for us. As he looked from that table of thanksgiving, he looked out and seen each and every one of us. And there overcame death, burial, and crucifixion. And now sits at your right hand. And we give you glory and praise for it. 
we continue to lift up our brother less. Father, we thank you for the healing that's already there. We thank you for those that you are going to surround him with. We pray for their wisdom and understanding through the power in the eyes of God. This is, this is your son. May they recognize that. We love you, we thank you, and we lift all of this up into your name, the name that is above every other name, and at his name, Jesus, we bow and say thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen.